Hello and welcome to Dialogue. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit kicks off this week in Samarkand, Uzbekistan, with Chinese President Xi Jinping attending the meeting, his first foreign visit since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. What will be at the top of the agenda for this year's summit, and what makes this year's meeting so different from those before? To find out, I'm joined today by Duma Oktobayev, former Prime Minister of the Kyrgyz Republic, Pavel Felgenhauer, Russian defense analyst, and Viktor Gaujikai, chair professor at Sudo University. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingdo. Welcome to the discussion. Uh, Mr. Otbayev, I will start with you. This is Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. Uh, so tell us, you know, what are the agenda? You know, what are the top issues that the leaders will discuss? Now, actually, uh, first of all, uh, the itself, uh, Summit of Shanghai Cooperation Organization in Samarkand, Uzbekistan, will be outstanding event. Uh, all world, I think, uh, looking at what would be the main topic for discussions who will be presented, who will meet whom. After pandemic, it will be the first foreign trip, for example, of uh, President of China, and uh, it will be a visit to Central Asia, which is very good. And uh, the expectation that uh, uh, leaders uh, of uh, something like 15 states, among them big and small, will attend the summit. It will be a quite interesting agenda. So Shanghai Cooperation Organization is uh, broadening. New members will be uh, going there, both as full members and observers and partners on dialogue. So it's quite intensive agenda. And the main uh, points uh, would be the building trust between the participants and to make this organization uh, a success. Uh, because uh, the, the broadening of the membership is already quite significant achievement. So the idea is that, that in the greater Eurasia, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization will unite a lot of uh, strong countries, uh, uh, among them uh, a leader, leaders of economic growth. Um, uh, it is already eight full members that will be broadening. Uh, uh, what an interesting um, development would be uh, the interest to, to joining uh, of this organization from Arab countries, among them such uh, influential ones as Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, and many others. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I believe that it will be a very interesting and very influential meeting. Mm -hmm. Victor, you know, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, you know, what is the original purpose uh, for the birth of such an organization? And, you know, uh, against the background that right now, we do see like uh, Russia and uh, West, the confrontation of uh, Ukraine issues and also the uh, decoupling sanctions. You know, we are uh, seeing this inflationary crisis, you know, uh, and, and the food crisis. There's so much to deal with, right? Well, when SCO was established about 20 years ago, its original mission was very clearly defined. That is to take coordination among member states to fight against extremism, terrorism and radicalization. Uh, originally uh, coming from Afghanistan, because uh, when SCO was established, the war led by the United, Nation, United States and uh, NATO against Afghanistan was already underway and the spillover of radicalization from Afghanistan into neighboring countries, including into China's Xinjiang Autonomous Region, was real. And there was a lot of concern that the radicalization may spread over to many countries and regions in this part of the world. I think this remains one of the focal points of SEO even up to today. However, in subsequent years, SEO has taken up more assignments and more uh, areas of interest, including, for example, helping to promote connectivity and uh, promote uh, uh, lifting uh, out of uh, poverty, for example, because these were considered as the root causes uh, feeding terrorism and radicalization. And more recently, you're absolutely right, the world is in a war and a peace period, and how can we really focus on preventing the spread of war 
and if war happens, how to de-escalate it and to bring it to an end as quickly as possible, and how to enable countries really focus on cooperation and uh, coordination rather than, for example, dividing countries into different blocks. This is a very urgent task for SCO during the summit meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Altbayev, uh, you know, this Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, can consist uh, of like several major countries, you know, of course, China, Russia, India, Pakistan, and the four Central Asian countries, and Iran expected to officially join this grouping. Uh, as you mentioned, I think itself, you know, to build a trust and win-win cooperation, I mean, itself is of great significance in terms of contributing to peace and security in this region. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, so without security and stability, the region and uh, neither country or region can develop. So uh, this uh, time in world history is quite uh, tense. Uh, in that respect, uh, a growing Asia, growing Eurasia should set an example on how to move on together and peacefully, number one. The important uh, point in the agenda of the discussion would be economic cooperation. And in that respect, uh, we are in Central Asia waiting for the quite interesting results. Uh, Central Asian countries is not very well populated. The total population of five countries are just 76 million, uh, uh, quite small. But what we what considering is that Central Asia would be breached of cooperation in greater Eurasia between center of economic power, uh, things will be moving through Central Asia. In that respect, economic cooperation, especially uh, transportation, uh, which will link a center of economic power through Central Asia is very big interest for us. And it's expected that uh, during the summit, it will be signed trilateral agreement between China Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan to build a railroad uh, from uh, China to Uzbekistan further to uh, uh, Caspian region, Iran, Turkey and Europe. So this uh, way will be about 900 kilometers shorter than existing route between uh, Asia Pacific to Europe and uh, the train could uh, link China and Southern Europe in seven to eight days. So it's quite a uh, quite interesting uh, idea. The so number second uh, logistic uh, point is that Uzbekistan is really willing to build the railroad from Uzbekistan to Pakistani ports of Badar and Karachi via Afghan territory, which is feasible, it's so-called Kabul corridor between uh, Termes and Uzbekistan, Mazari Sharif, Kabul and Peshawar to Pakistani railway system. So again, it would be interesting development, which again, Central Asia would be serving as a hub for uh, linking uh, different economic uh, regions. So in that respect, we're really looking forward that Central Asia would go for the so-called all good time of the Great Silk Road when Central Asia was the most proper, prosperous part of the world and was um, uh, a linked east and west. On that way, uh, we developed quite healthy uh, along the ancient times. And there is no reason why we, we wouldn't repeat this uh, type of development. And uh, what we expect that uh, during the summit it will be uh, practical uh, economic decisions will be made. Mm -hmm. uh, Pavel, uh, obviously, uh, you know, Moscow for Russia, they have their own vision of economic development, but which is more of less, uh, more or less the same uh, as the regional countries here. That is, if there's a say, stability and development in this region and given uh, oil and gas rich countries, including Russia, and also say strong economies like uh, India, like China, there, there's a great demand of oil and gas, for either from Russia, from Uzbekistan, from Kazakhstan, for example. Uh, there's a great potential for them to develop together, let's say. Uh, the SCO is a wonderful organization because its core mission, its main, uh, its main thrust 
as it began to stabilize Central Asia through development and opening it up to the world is something that everyone supports. Uh, Iran supports, America supports, well, Europe supports, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, and uh, together with India. I mean, this is uh, something that unites everyone. And that's uh, why this is a, such a successful organization uh, with growing membership. Actually, it's some years ago, uh, the United States applied to become a SCO observer nation. It was rejected, of course, but in, in the light of its main mission, uh, of the SCO. America, those would be not so alien there. I mean, two uh, sworn enemies, Pakistan and India, are good members, even though they still uh, aim nuclear weapons at each other. I mean, uh, you can, uh, and not that they became friends. They continue to be enemies, but they are on board this wonderful bus, the SCO, which I say is a very successful organization, and uh, its uh, success will continue. Uh, Ms. Odubayev, you know, uh, you know, there are some media report in the West that, uh, you know, uh, here you see the SCO and you will see the meeting between the Chinese leader and the Russian leader. Somehow, oh, they are strengthening their stance against the West. SCO is an anti-West or anti-US organization. Is it the case? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think that uh, the, the countries, members of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, thinking of the modern world as a zero-sum game. And no, the, the intention is that growing Asia should be much more united, Eurasia, huh? to, to, to uh, work on economic prosperity, on strengthening trade, on in, in, in improvement of infrastructure uh, and uh, mutual investments, for example, is very important. But here I wanted to underline one important thing is that we are really interested in so-called uh, high-quality Belt and Road uh, communication and interaction. So instead of only trade, uh, only look focus to the trade, we have to focus on the technology of the 21st century. So we are in Central Asia have very educated population. So we are thinking that next investments from China, from Russia, from Iran, whatever, would be high quality investments. I don't see the reason why we will not create in our region Silicon Valley of Eurasia. I know very well that China is moving very quickly in high tech development, in quantum computing, in green technologies, whatever. And uh, there is a lot of uh, in, uh, investigation in, in high tech area in it, uh, digital technologies in such uh, cities as Hangzhou or Shenzhen, why don't uh, China would build around those cities new Silicon Valleys, attract not only local talents, but talents all over the Asia, when talents will come and will mix with each other and exchange ideas and generate technology of 21st centuries. Why don't we focus on generating Nobel Prize laureates from our uh, continent. This is, should be focused for the uh, next generation of discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Pavel, um, uh, picking up on you know, what you previously said, this is a very successful organization. And probably, I don't know whether that's the reason you see there are uh, countries basically lining up to join this organization, you know, either uh, from Middle Eastern uh, part of the region or the Asian countries there. Uh, so what attracts other members to, uh, you know, wanting to be part of this SEO? Uh, so the um, big uh, core mission of the uh, SEO is uh, uh, stability in Central Asia, uh, preventing the spread of uh, jihadist uh, uh, radicalism, and any country is going to sign up to that, almost any. I mean, uh, countries that are diverse and don't agree on other things agree on that, that that's a bad, that that's a bad thing. And they agree on that there should be economic development in Central Asia, that the region should be open to the world, that there should be uh, uh, poverty decrease, there's going to be, I mean, it, the SCO is an organization that's against everything bad and for everything good. 
And so it's no, uh, uh, that's why the very, that explains why so many countries are ready to join, that you, uh, support, that you this organization supports what you're interested in, opposes what you see as a threat, and does not require from you that you have to uh, increase your defense budget, uh, surrender your sovereignty, prepare for a war with anyone. So this is a bus that carries a different nations to a brighter future. Mr. Arbayev, obviously there's a, you know, a greater commonality, let's say, you know, because every country wishes to have this stability, uh, free from extremism, free from terrorism, and focusing on uh, prosperity and technology uh, in, in that respect, a cooperation with countries in particular, neighboring countries and regional countries. Maybe that's the reason, you know, people, you know, other countries want to be part of the SEO. No, it's, it's like a tree. If you have uh, strong roots, if you have sun and you have water, then the tree will be healthy and big and beautiful. So that is why uh, more countries wanted to join Shanghai Cooperation Organization because it's a solid organization. So, but as I said, a successful organization, you have to look forward, not only three years from now, not five, but 10. And in that respect, I would ignite discussion about high quality Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Let's generate talents around us and let's move on in 21st century agenda. Then more countries will be coming there. So success, it doesn't mean that success will continue forever. So looking for in front of us, cooperating with new world order, with trust between each other, will, will, will make Shanghai Cooperation Organization maybe the model of future unification of the whole world. If you look now to Shanghai Cooperation Organization, then we have only developing countries, which are there, but after some time, the economy will grow. It will be center of attraction from all over the world, including, I can't exclude it, even advanced countries, which could say, okay, this is interesting model. Why don't we join? So we have to look around and build trust among ourselves, among other countries. I can exclude that maybe some uh, African countries would like to join. Why not? But first we have to build this atmosphere of trust in our geographical area. By the way, Afghanistan will be just in between. And in, in terms of uh, dealing with Afghanistan, it looks like it's chicken and egg. Uh, international community do not trust to Afghan government. Afghan government don't know what to do in order to make bridges with international community. And somebody should uh, uh, come through this di dilemma. And what is happening? that in Samarkand meeting, President of Uzbekistan would propose to uh, build a railroad through Afghan territory to Pakistan. Why don't uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization would react to it? And on that way, try to understand what happening in this uh, difficult country. Uh, well, Pavel, uh, another uh, interesting um, issue people are looking at is, you know, India as a member of SEO, of course, uh, Prime <coughs> Minister um, Modi uh, is at the meeting, um, but earlier uh, India has uh, stopped to join the trade pillar of the U.S. proposed uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. What do you make of that move, you know, why India is resistant uh, or resisting to join uh, that trade sector of uh, IPF? Well, India uh, under uh, Modi is a very kind of India-centered. Uh, they uh, pick uh, a cooperation with other nations and with groups of nations uh, on the basis of their own self-interest, and they're not kind of taken by any uh, ideological big standoffs. Uh, they do not want to become too dependent, and also, of course, they believe that India is a pillar in its own uh, in the world, uh, uh, also a superpower, and so they're very mindful not to become someone's kind of ally or, or 
a, a, a vassal or be seen as that. And so that's why they're kind of picky in what they, uh, in what fields they cooperate and what fields they don't. There is a general kind of in, increase of uh, Indian American cooperation in different fields, strategic and military. Uh, but India is also very, very guarded not to uh, spoil its relations with Russia, not to be seen as a kind of American proxy or an American ally, one of many. And so this is a, uh, that's the way India builds its foreign policy, its economic policy, uh, very independently. Mm -hmm. And that's how they're going to apparently continue to do it, uh, maneuvering to, to find the best way to serve Indian interests. Mm -hmm. Well, Victor, India uh, has this strong tradition of cherishing their independence. They are not uh, any vassal state of any superpower, for example. And uh, they see the interest as a part of SEO, and also that's an important contribution to this regional development, stability, and connectivity. Absolutely. I think India is truly a great nation, and I'm sure India will be a very proud and very successful and important member of SEO. You mentioned IPEF. I think one reason why India is not enthusiastic about membership in IPEF is because IPEF, in a sense, is a sham because it did not go through the congressional process in the United States. It did not get approval from the United States Congress. Therefore, the United States really has nothing to offer to the other members, except ideological struggles, for example, preparation for war. The real essence of that IPF is probably just to isolate China. But all the other members of the IPF, including India, for example, have very significant large economic trade interests in dealing with China. So I think India is being realistic and pragmatic if it believes it could get a lot of uh, windfalls and economic benefits by joining IPF, I'm sure India will join. However, there is nothing on the table. There is no cake, for example, that the United States can really offer to other members of the IPEF. Uh, Pavel, obviously, on the sideline of the summit, um, uh, there are meetings uh, of leaders, bilateral meetings, trilateral meetings, you know. Uh, uh, so, you know, between China and Russia, uh, what's your expectation out of the meetings between the leaders? Well, there's going to be an, at least one agreement signed that's a, a partnership, a, a extended partnership between Russia and Uzbekistan. Uh, apparently, no, no other important, uh, at least Russia, won't be participating in other agreements, uh, formal agreements signed, but it's going to be, of course, very important to speak to these leaders and uh, that they are, they are in person, first time at such a big summit uh, since the COVID pandemic separated the leaders and the nations. And uh, that will be, of course, very important for Russia right now, because Russia, as I say, in a very acute a confrontational situation with the West that needs support where it can get it and will be building bridges with Asian nations uh, and Asians, uh, nations to the East and the South. Uh, economically, that's important. Politically, that's important for Russia. Technologically, it's very important Such sanctions have cut off Russian access to Western technologies. Russia will be turning to uh, China, India, and other nations of the East to find technologies it can't find right now in other places. So for Russia, it's, of course, very, very important summit. Mm -hmm. and, and Pavel, obviously, uh, you know, we are seeing like Russia is uh, turning East, and uh, because of, uh, I would say, uh, the steps taken by the European Union, for example, to decouple from Russia in terms of oil and gas and other sectors, and Russia is turning to Asian countries and other parts of the world, for example, selling oil and gas to uh, India, uh, China, and also Indonesia now is a, you know, considering, you know, this is optional, this is one option to buy oil and gas from Russia, as you said, uh, you know, there's also a lot probably to offer uh, to Russia too. 
Oh, yes, of course, and uh, say there, there's also some a uh, lot of trade increasing or attempts to increase uh, uh, seriously trade with uh, Iran, which has also been under sanctions and has its own industrial base that it developed and it could share with Russia. So yes, that's a very, very important uh, strategic uh, drive for Russia to the east. And this uh, summit in Samarkand, not, though officially it's primarily about the problems of Central Asia, which of course are also very important for Russia. I mean, Russia, of course, is in confrontation with the West, but that does not mean that Russia uh, does not have any interests or uh, on stability of Central Asia per se. Mm -hmm. Victor, uh, you know, there's a number, like say, uh, from January to August this year, uh, China-Russia trade jumped by 31% year on year. Uh, and it, of course, they have agreed to uh, more deal basically on the uh, oil pipeline, gas pipeline. You know, there's a, I mean, we are seeing the potential for more cooperation. Uh, partly also because of the sanctions, you see uh, there's a great demand for uh, for the for the say you know uh, even the Chinese clothes, Chinese automobile. I mean, there's a there's a natural match right now. Uh, to, to exploit the potential of the two countries. Absolutely. No one in the world should be surprised that China and Russia uh, do get along very well. And the normalization of relations between China and Russia actually started in 1989, two years uh, before the emergence of uh, today's Russia. And China-Russian border has always remained a peaceful, mutually beneficial, and a good neighborliness has been characterizing China-Russian relations ever since 89, and especially ever since 1991. And ever since 2000, when President uh, uh, Putin became the paramount leader of uh, Russia, China-Russia relations has intensified. And uh, this all started and developed way before the outbreak of the special military operation in Ukraine starting on February the 24th, 2022. And the two countries are really committed to uh, coordinate their economic development because the two economies are highly complementary to each other. China needs almost all the goods that Russia can supply, and Russia now needs many things that China readily and uh, very easily and very efficiently produce in all large quantities. So China-Russian cooperation will not only stay coarse, but develop in uh, bounds going forward, leaps and bounds. And no country should really believe that they can set China and Russia apart. And China-Russia relations and cooperation will withstand all the vicissitudes in the world. And this is independent, regardless, regardless of whatever happens in, elsewhere in the world, China-Russia will be committed to further develop their friendship and cooperation and good neighborliness. With that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.